Hello, Science9. Today we are going to be talking about pollution and the effects on the ecosystem. So that's the learning intention today. Success, how do you know that you are doing well in this topic, is that you can define the difference between non-point source and point source, as well as persistent and non-persistent pollution. Understanding what the word bioindicator species means, um, explaining factors that affect the health of a water system, as well as understanding how to use bioindicators to determine the healthiness of a ecosystem. So we're going to start. This is not in the copy of notes I've given you. This is just a general aside. So we're going to just start with a general understanding of pollution and pollutant. So pollutant is the material that will cause harm to a living organism, where pollution is the alteration of the environment producing a condition that is harmful to living things. So what we say here is pollution is an effect of pollutants. Okay, so when we use the word pollution, we're saying there's something that is causing that pollution. So just keep that in mind as we're running through this. So the first little bit of notes we're going to talk about is you have a chart and you're going to fill in your chart for me on my copy of notes that talk about non-persistent and persistent types of pollution. So non-persistent is something you may not have heard anyone say yet, but essentially what it means is it can be broken down by natural processes. Things like bacteria, different types of chemical reactions, they can break down those different types of pollutants and they actually can go back into the uh, environment. Now, sometimes they have a negative effect on the environment, but they're in now a more broken down form. So in your chart, please define non-persistent and then put the examples beside it. So definition can be broken down. Examples are things like sewage and fertilizer. You may remember me saying the word persistent when I talked about DDT. DDT is a persistent pesticide, so it means it breaks down really slow or it doesn't break down at all. It stays in its chemical form. So that's really bad because if it's not breaking down, it can become very toxic in the environment. There's ways to eliminate um, persistent pollutants. If you go out to the dump, you actually are not allowed to just put your paints, your paint thinners, or your refrigerators anywhere because they have certain chemicals in them that can't be broken down. So examples of this I've already said is DDT, petroleum products, anything with heavy metals, or anything that's pretty toxic to the environment. So again, non-persistent, I can break it down. Persistent, I cannot break it down. So that's going to lead us into where do these types of pollutions come from? How does it actually occur? So at the bottom of my note package, you're going to find something called a point source pollution. We're going to define point source pollution or point source pollutants as contaminants that come from a specific source. So when we're talking pollutants, those are the chemicals that are harmful to animals on the ecosystem. And they can be either persistent or non-persistent, but they're coming from a specific place and they're contaminating the environment. An example of this would be the underground gas tanks leaking, directly dumping sewage into a lake or a river. Okay, These are specific sources where we can see where the contaminants are coming from. The other side to the story is non-point source pollutants. So this is when you have pollutants that are mixed into the environment, but um, they're mixed in at a source, but they come from a variety of different sources. They are, not, uh, they are mixed in before they are detected, essentially. We call these non-point source pollutants. Essentially, if you think about fields or golf courses or farmer's fields and we fertilize those fields, we know fertilizer is a uh, non-persistent pollutant. That fertilizer, as it rains, will be picked up by the rain and it'll be washed down into the river. So then all of a sudden now you're going to see things like phosphates and nitrogens and uh, potassium in your water sources, but it's because it's coming from areas such as farms and suburban development and forestry where you may be laying down fertilizer and trying to make things grow. So a non-point source, uh, sorry, non-point source pollutants come from a variety of areas and make their way into the water source. Point source pollutants come directly in contact with the water source from the place that it is contaminated. So that is the difference. And like I said, you can put those in your notes. Anything underlined, guys, will be where you want to write. 
So what this leads us into is just below in my notes under the chart of persistent and non-persistent, there's some fill in the blank. So most pollution lowers the ability of an environment to support life. We know this, pollution is not good. We're gonna specifically talk about when we mix a pollutant in with water, what happens? And often it's causing oxygen or dissolved oxygen to decrease. When you decrease dissolved oxygen, you decrease the types of variety of organisms found in those lakes, ponds, rivers, whatever. So back to topic one, unit one, I should say, it creates less biodiversity. Remember, biodiversity is the variety of organisms found in an ecosystem. If you add a pollutant in and it's causing oxygen to be lowered in a lake or in a pond, all of a sudden things are gonna start dying and you're gonna have less biodiversity. We want to take care of our lakes, rivers, streams, anything water-wise. We want to take care of the planet, but we can do this with water specifically by using a couple of these chemical indicators. So you're going to write all five of these down. Okay, We can actually measure the amount of oxygen that's found in water. We call that dissolved oxygen through tests. We can also look at dissolved carbon dioxide. We really want high levels of dissolved oxygen, but really low levels of dissolved carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide is a waste product for living animals, such as ourselves or any other animal. We breathe it out. High levels of it is actually toxic, especially within your body. Dissolved phosphates and dissolved nitrates are really important to be low in water systems because if you have dissolved phosphates or nitrates, you can actually have something called eutrophication, which is a bio 20 topic that we will talk about when you come to bio 20. Phosphates and nitrates come from fertilizer. So as they are a non point source pollutant, as they enter the water, they actually can cause lots of damage by causing all the plants around the water to grow, which uses up oxygen and doesn't leave enough for animals. And the pH of the water system, we've learned that some lakes become acidic, so we have to do a process called liming. pH is important to understand that we have pH at a neutral level, so all organisms can survive. Why are we talking so much about this? Well, it comes down to, we wanna be able to also use something called bioindicator species or biological indicator species. Chemical indicators are great, but you actually have to go and test and you have to grab all the material and use. You can use your eyes to see how healthy a system is by using something called bioindicator species. They're essentially species found in a water system that tell you how healthy the ecosystem is. The most useful are actually something called macroinvertebrates. Essentially, they're tiny, but they're visible to the eye and they don't have backbones. So think bugs, essentially. Okay, so if you were to go down to King Cooley and go to the creek that runs through King Cooley and capture a bunch of different bugs that you find there, you can actually classify them and say, hey, these need lots of oxygen to live here or these don't. And you can actually tell how healthy your water system is. An example of one that we would see around Canada are trout and perch, which are a type of fish. They're fish that lives only in clean water. They need lots and lots of oxygen. So if you're fishing at a lake that has lots of perch, you know that, that that lake is really healthy with a lot of dissolved oxygen. If you're fishing at a lake with no perch and no trout whatsoever, it could indicate that the dissolved oxygen levels are a little low and that pollutants are present. So you can write this down under the example underneath biological indicators. I've been talking a lot about oxygen levels. Okay, and how there's things that indicate oxygen levels, but we can actually increase and decrease oxygen levels within water by doing a couple different things. Please write all of these down in your notes. We can increase oxygen level by making sure the water is cool and cold. So by making sure we're not adding in any heat to that water, we can keep the oxygen levels up. Aeration or turbid water. Those are maybe words you're not recognizing. Essentially guys, it's this stuff right here. When water gets turned up, when water gets mixed around. So if you have a very fast flowing rapid that hits lots of bumps and turns, that's aeration or turbid water. And it's also important that plants are available to, the, to increase oxygen levels because plants go through photosynthesis. Photosynthesis gives off oxygen. So if you have plants in your water system, you're getting oxygen inputted into there. The opposite would be hot water, having tons and tons of organisms that give off carbon dioxide instead of oxygen, and then eutrophication, which is that word I talked about with phosphates and nitrates. So it's important to understand how to increase the oxygen levels 
but it's also important to understand how it could be decreased. This is going to lead us now into guys talking about those bioindicator species. So you actually have a chart in your notes for me, and if not, it is posted in your textbook that shows a variety of organisms that live in good quality water, moderate quality water, and poor quality water. I'm going to pose these two questions to you, and I want you to answer them before we move on. So will organisms that indicate poor water quality be found in water of an oxygen concentration of nine parts per million? What that means is, is if you have a macroinvertebrate that lives in really bad water, do you think you could find it in very clean water? Also, how about organisms with really good quality water, so they live in really high oxygen content, will they be found in really poor oxygen content water? So I want you to answer both of these and then hear the answer in the next couple slides. So posed to you were two questions about how organisms can live in water. If it's a good quality water, could um, bad quality organisms live in it and vice versa. So organisms that like poor quality water, such as um, things like black fly larvae, leech, aquatic worms, they actually can be found in any type of water. They like poor quality water, they can thrive in poor quality water, but they're okay with good quality water too. So if you're a poor quality water organism, you like it all. However, if your organism is a bioindicator species of a good quality water, so like perch or trout, or a stonefly nymph, or a water penny beetle, if you like really clean water, you're not going to be found in really poor quality water. Okay, you only like clean water. So that's what this beautiful picture is showing is here's my clean zone and look at all of the biodiversity that is found in my clean zone. As my tolerance becomes lower, uh, sorry, as my, my pollutants become higher, my tolerance becomes lower. And all of a sudden you're looking at a very unhealthy system with very little biodiversity. None of these clean living animals will live over here. But you will notice that some of the non-clean living animals can kind of float their ways this way, okay? And that's just meaning that poor quality water, the organisms that live in it can live in a variety of situations. So tomorrow we are going to work with these ideas and do an activity. If you have questions or concerns, please let me know.